I'm Rachel Woody, and it's July 19th, 2016. We're here at Nicholson Library with Juan Pablo, or JP, Velo. And our first question for you is why wine? Why wine? Um, um, I think it's just feel natural. I think it's a part of my DNA. Um, I grew up uh, born and raised in Mendoza, Argentina. Um, we were surrounded by vineyards, wines, and come from an Italian family. So wine has been always there. So it's been in the church, at the table, during lunch, during dinner. Um, on my mom's side, they are 100% um, Italian on both sides. So they used to work for one of the biggest winery in America, in the whole continent, back in the, in the 70s, and the 60s, 70s, and the little bit in the 80s. And then on my dad's side, they are, um, he's half French, half, uh, half Italian, and uh, f the, the, imp the interesting part is that the, f the French side got into the vineyard, in the growing grapes, mm -hmm. and the Italian side got into more into the winemaking part. Mm -hmm. So I think it got a little bit of both, and um, growing up in that area, in Mendoza, which is the capital, of, one capital of the country, um, if you're gonna have a, if you're gonna get a decent job, it's you gotta go in the wine industry, so. Um, so that's why, um, but when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, um, I thought I would be an architect. I like to build things, and uh, mm -hmm. so I went to, a high school that was uh, oriented that way, so I was just drawing. And at a side point, I said, uh, this is not gonna work. This, I think I was 14, actually. I said, no, I'm tired of drawing, so I prefer to go actually be outside. And I was really close to one of my um, um, grandparents, so actually he was in the, so he was living by this winery that I was just mentioned that actually this uh, Swiss guy, uh, Swiss Italian guy built, and he also built a neighborhood, um, a soccer club, they had their own uh, hospital, wow. school, I mean, it was so big. And uh, so I used to go there, I used to play bocce with him. And um, so I said, well, I made like this too. So um, I, so I swapped uh, high school and I went to one is more agriculture oriented just to see if I would like that. That was a new program going on back in Mendoza in that time that actually you can get the feeling of what you may want like later on instead of just getting to the university and then say oh, this is not for me and just go somewhere else. Right. So basically I took that one and um, I liked it so that was for in a different city. And um, I like this, so I went to college. Um, so I'm an engineer, I call it an engineer with a focus in winemaking and vineyard management. But wine, it wasn't my thing back in that time. I would say that I was more passionate about growing grapes, that was my thing. So mm -hmm. I wanna be outside. Uh, the whole idea was just driving a pickup truck and going from vineyard to vineyard. Just that was the, the thing. I mean, they really, I, I remember looking at some engineers in the back, in the past, and then uh, just seeing them going around and said, that, 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 "That's me right there." Um, but things changed later on, anyway. So, how did it change? How did you switch from loving the land and the grape? growing part of it to being a winemaker? Well, um, well, I won't say it wasn't my passion. I would say that I didn't want to be related to wine because of my dad. And, uh, he's a wine broker, and I didn't want to end up working with him. <laughs> so <laughs> this will go way back. Uh, so, um, but um, when I was done with college, we had this trip to Europe. So we spent like a a month and a half uh, traveling around Europe, mm -hmm. uh, visited some um, um, wine regions in Spain, in France, a little bit in Italy. And because um, I knew there will be a lot of time to spend over there, I said, well, maybe I'll look for a job over there because I'm Italian, so I have a, I'm a citizen over there, so mm -hmm. I may look for something. So by looking at online, back in, the, this is what we're talking about back in 01. 
um, internet wasn't what it is right now. So there's not a lot of things popping up, but most, the only thing that I found for just working abroad was to come here to the US. And, um, and there was one so I said that was like a chain program that you can come and work during harvest and then come back. And I said, well, I mean, like that one, the only problem back there was English. I didn't know any English. And mm -hmm. uh, I knew the country. I think I knew the, the US through the movies. We probably know <laughs> what's realistic here. Yeah? But um, that was at least I knew about, through college, about Napa Valley, uh, the wine industry. And I was fascinated with that. So um, I decided to camp, but um, they gave me three options. So there was one of them. So there was uh, Washington, Washington State, Oregon, and California. Mm -hmm. So California, it was at the, the time that I had to arrive, I had to the same time that I had, uh, that was still in, in Europe. So the other two options were Washington and Oregon, and then when they say Washington, for some reason, I thought they were talking about Washington, D.C., and I said, mm. there's no way that I would go there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> literally, there's no wine there. I mean, there may be one, but no grape. So I didn't know about there was a Washington State as well, which is, I really like the state, and they, they make really good wines here. So, so I decided to come to Oregon. And, um, so the, most of the jobs they were offered here was for making wine, not for being in the vineyard. So literally oh, okay. I had to swap from the growing part into the winemaking part. Mm -hmm. um, now I, I do both anyway, but uh, yeah. That, that, I, I don't think I discovered, I, I think I got it inside me, but I, I, I didn't know that I had that passion for wine, so like for winemaking. The, um, I thought it was just growing the grapes, it was the thing, but now it's like both. I just love both parts. So like I spend a lot of time now in the vineyard, and then like, like I was talking with Rich, so just getting closer to harvest, now I had to swap my mind, getting ready for just being inside the winery, not so much outside the winery, so. Right. When you were looking at doing the exchange and coming to Oregon, did you know a lot about the wine industry at that time, or? Well, the, the thing that got me was uh, Pinot Noir. Um, Pinot Noir back in the time in Argentina was only for sparkling wines, uh, like it is here too, and in France. Um, I didn't know anything about Pinot Noir, like, like a still wine. So um, that was one thing I said, well, at least I can go and try. And um, um, for anyone from anyone in Argentina to come uh, and work in the US, it will be, it will put you ahead of anyone actually working full time in Argentina. So it was a plus. Mm -hmm. Either because you're here, you see more technology, or either because you know the language. So I think that's what the main reason, one of the main reasons that I, I took the uh, challenge, because it was a big challenge for me. And so I came and I started working with Pinot Noir because I came to uh, Willamette Valley Vineyards. That's the first mm -hmm. wine that they brought me. And, um, um, so the first impression with Pinot Noir, it, it wasn't the one I was expecting, so it was totally different. It, coming from Mendoza, which is so warm and the ones are so thick, uh, more concentrated, darker and everything. Mm -hmm. The first time that we were, so when we were making Pinot Noir, I was just uh, working in the lab, so I was taking samples. So I opened the sample port from the tank I get the wine and it's like, it's like this pale wine. And like, said, oh my God, man, there's just someone screwed it up. So I got to the <laughs> winemaker and said, then somebody put water in this. He said, uh, no, why? Well, it's so light. He said, well, that's been on one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> right. That was the first impression of Pinot Noir, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, like I said, we used to make Pinot Noir into a white wine, so I never saw the color of the wine, so. Mm -hmm. But things are changing, so that now they're more dark and everything, so. Um, then I have a friend that actually, she came like uh, probably f uh, four, four years before me, mm -hmm. and she was saying that, um, talking about the Willamette Valley, the whole thing. So, which I yeah, like a lot, so um, I said, well, I try. Uh, it was a, a hard time um, for me, not because of the language, it's because um, 
the 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 timing was it was about timing. Um, it, that was right after the September 11. So my actually my flight was on uh, September 14, and I got delayed until uh, September 21st. It took me more than two days to get from Mendoza to here, and the, the, every every airport was just chaos. It's just. Uh, about time, you, you can see that at the airport, you, the, the people working at the airport, they won't see any immigrant and they won't see anyone coming into the state. There was just uh, a lot of paranoia about, um, like I say, it was about time, but I came <laughs> and I survived. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, for not knowing a lot of English when you came here, how did you sort of overcome that or? or catch up or? Um, well, that reminds me of those silent movies, like Chaplin movies, like there's a lot of body language. Right. And uh, I have a, a Derek was my boss in the lab and he did a great job with me. Um, I knew what I was doing, because I'd done it in, in Argentina, but I didn't know how to express myself. So basically I was a, I was a deaf guy. Um, so it was like, uh, no, 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 it's yes, 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 yes. And uh, he knew some Spanish because he's from, uh, excuse me, from California. And I was able to actually, to, I know how to write some, some writing and some uh, reading, but mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't able to listen, the listening part or the speaking part was just sucks, big time. So I was like, what was that, like probably two months of into just getting home and like, uh, and question myself if I did a good job or not, but I think um, that's why you start learning really fast. Immersion, I think, probably the best part. And then the, the other part was uh, some Mexican guys also working in the winery, and I couldn't even talk to them here because they couldn't understand. Uh, our vocabulary is totally different. So. Right. So I was trying to talk to them, they didn't get that. I was trying to talk in English, they didn't get that part. I said, okay, I'm done. So I was just, reading and listening to music, English music. So I think I got, uh, maybe after the, sec the first month, I think I got to more, the, the listening part got better, so I was understanding more, and then I was just starting to enjoy the, the experience. Right, that's quite an immersion. It, it is a, a full immersion, I'll put it that way, <laughs> 100%. Yes. And that's why you learn, that's, that's the way you do it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something interesting as far as obviously Argentinian Spanish differs from Mexican Spanish, and I believe your wife is Puerto Rican. Yes, yes, she is. So, how in your mind, like, how can you, how do you do that? I guess. Um, when I when I met her uh, back in two thousand two, um, we end up saying things in English because mm. her vocabulary was different, and we couldn't understand what we know what we're saying but a few words that we didn't know what what, what it was so our english was actually our common uh, ground right oh, there okay. so we'll say in english plus uh, puerto rico is part of the u.s so it's english is common or that so mm -hmm. um so any experience of well my so agency spanish is, is totally different because of uh, immigration. So we have, uh, like I mentioned, my family, Italian, a lot of French people, uh, the Spaniards, and the, some dialect going on in, the, in Buenos Aires, in the capital city, which is a combination of uh, French, Spanish, and Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, and we use all that. Mm -hmm. Even now I'm, I'm learning some Italian, and it gets, I get so confused because it's really close to my Spanish. So sometimes I don't know if I'm just talking in Spanish, so it says Italian or whatever it is. Or so anyway, so by getting out of the country is always a challenge because you gotta use a, a more um, standard Spanish, more, um, how you call it, so more from Spain. So without the Spaniard accent because they're, they're, they're don't thing anyway. So I used to, I used to teach at Chemeca and uh, Spanish in the vineyard was one of my classes. So I, I got into that. So just uh, teaching how the proper Spanish will be from Spain, and then. Uh, 
uh, teaching them how to actually get into Spanglish because that if you this was related to people that actually would work in the vineyard. Right. So and in the vineyard you don't get Spanish, you get Spanglish. It's a lot of Spanglish. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that was the funny part for my student because they want to learn two things. And I say, well, you want to work here, so you need the Spanish. But if you're going to go outside, you go to South America, I mean, Spanish is a no, no, no one will get it. So if you want to learn actually Spanish, you got to learn all the different ways to say it. So different vocabulary, different accents. And right. so I guess it's the same for English if you go to New Zealand, Australia, the UK, mm -hmm. uh, so and so. That's impressive. So you actually, you became a teacher of it after mastering all the variety. Yeah, that, that was, um, um, yeah, I think that was a personal goal, I'll put it that way. Um, if, if I go back to what I was, and now I can see myself right now, I think it's, uh, it's I don't have many personal goals, but those are the ones that I can feel proud. Probably the language, I've, mm -hmm. I still make mistakes, so like, you know, and my accent is still here. So, but uh, I'm not planning on changing anything. So it is what it is, and um, I'm seeing my kids now. So they're uh, my son. He's turning four in a few weeks, uh, so he's bilingual, and uh, you can see how much how how much time he spent with me or my wife because by the way he speaks so and uh, so I'm the one trying to do it in my Argentinian way and mm -hmm. you can see them comes mom and she will do it her way not right. because we're trying to steal our boy away from us but it's just the way that we say it. and then uh, at the at preschool sometimes they say what they uh, because he has some bilingual teacher. Why did he speak so funny? I said, what's so funny? <laughs> well, they, they said like, uh, I don't know, this, the, the, his Spanish kind of different. So, but, said different, not funny, different. Because if <laughs> right. you're from different Argentina, country. so yeah. yeah. Well, if, if you're not used to that, so probably it, it may sound funny. Mm. Yeah, but it, may, it could be funny though, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's... Um, and then all the fights every time because we have a lot of friends from, uh, we live in Corvallis, so, so my wife went to OSU. And uh, so we had a lot of friends from many different countries, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, Uruguay, you name it. And every time we get to here, it's like, oh my God, man. So the way that we say things is like, no, you st no, no, that's not the right translation. There should be this and like mm -hmm. that. So we go back to, uh, we we'll Google the word and we go to the, uh, the Real Academy of Spanish from Spain. And uh, it's just, it sucks on time because uh, if you got more than, I think in more than 3 million or 4 million people talking and saying that word, they will, it will pass. And then like, for example, Puerto Rico, there are four million. So whatever they say, it will pass <laughs> too. say, oh my God, that's no proper Spanish. But it is, so that's the big fight that I have with my wife all the time. One of them. <laughs> <laughs> At least one of them. Uh-huh, okay. So the, the language part, I, it's been a, a plus. It's just hilarious for me, so I like it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, an added complication that we don't necessarily think about or see that it, you have a language, Spanish or English, and yet there are so many different dialects or words or countries where there's going to be native language yeah. there. Yeah. And uh, for example, Miami is, uh, is an amazing place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just because the beaches and everything, it's just it, the, the, it's the, um, the, the Miami Spanish. It's just a mix of all Latin American Spanish. Right. And there's some English words. I mean, it's like, it's fascinating, but it's also so confusing because it's just a mix. And they throw it. And then, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> right. And then you right. end up talking in English because you don't get anything what they're saying. So mm -hmm. that, that's it. <laughs> that's Miami. <laughs> Uh, moving on to some of the places you've worked at, Willamette Valley Vineyards, Soder Vineyards, Dobbs Family Estate, and of course, Sylvan Ridge Winery. Mm -hmm. What were some of the similarities or differences with all the places you worked and uh, what were some of the influences you picked up from there? 
Um, so Willamette Valley was uh, back in 01 and 02. So I went back to Mendoza, back over here. Um, and I was working for Joe Dabbs back mm -hmm. in that time. He was a winemaker. Um, uh, last year with Willamette Valley Vineyard, he was in 02. And then Forrest took over. Um, so when I think I got hired by him back in 04 because I used to work for him in, in Willamette Valley. So it was pretty similar. Mm -hmm. um, with Tony it was different because uh, on the third, that was on the third year, that was 03. Um, it was uh, way smaller. So we went from a big winery to a really small winery. Mm -hmm. I mean, totally. So I defend, um, but I asked for that. So when I, I applied for the third round on this uh, exchange program, I, I, I say that I would like to work in something small. I want to see the whole process and working for big wineries, you don't get to see that. Mm. Plus, the winery that we used to work in Mendoza was even bigger than Willamette. So we just have them and I just don't want to. I don't want to work in a big place. I want to get to know, I want to go from the vineyard to literally to the bottles. So I want to, the whole spectrum of uh, winemaking mm -hmm. and vineyard. So I got that with Tony um, and, and he was just building his wine. He was still living in um, California. Uh, he used to have a winery in Carneros. Um, uh, so we were living here in McMinnville, and I, I brought my, what was my girlfriend back in that time, uh, my wife, uh, Doris. So she came with me, and uh, I think that was probably different too, because uh, um, I, was, I was by myself the first two years, and then I came with her. Um, um, so it, it, it was different in that part. So volume size and also the, they own their own vineyard right there was by the wine, which is I like a lot. Um, uh, with Joe, um, he didn't have his own vineyard back in that time, so we were buying, he was buying grapes from different growers. I, I didn't get to see the vineyards of the growers, but he was renting uh, a facility owned by Willamette Valley Vineyards in Tualatin. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so they got a vineyard over there, and that's how I actually became a good friend with a friend Loesa, which is the vineyard manager for Willamette Valley Vineyards. So we're still okay. friends. Uh, he's a great guy uh, because I was, like I said, my, my passion started right there in the vineyard, so growing grapes. So. Um, so I spent a year with Joe, and then uh, um, my wife, um, she got a full scholarship for a PhD program at OSU, and she said, well, I got this, and, and, and we're, we're moving. I said, we used to live in Tualatin back in the time. And said, we're moving where? I said, we're moving to Corvallis. I said, where is Corvallis? Down south, and I said, How far? And then she said, Probably hour 20, hour 40. I said, Okay. Um, so I used to work in Forest Grove. I said, uh, There's no way that I can, I mean, there's no way <laughs> I can travel or commute from Corvallis to Forest Grove. I said, No, you may have to look for another job. I said, Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, back in that time, at least in 01, probably or, or 03 or 04, it got a, num a bigger number of wine, but it was only 250, 300, I think, about mm -hmm. to 700 right mm -hmm. now. So um, I started looking at if we see anything available. So uh, if I watch, I will go with whatever. Because mm -hmm. she, for her, it was her thing. So she wanted to become um, a PhD uh, in order for her to become uh, a professor. So I said, okay. And then I uh, was looking at, and there was an uh, opening position uh, for assistant winemaker, uh, Ceylon Rich. And I applied, and I got the job, actually, which is one hour commute, but it was better than hour 40 or whatever, two hours, whatever it was. Um, right. So that was back on 05, and I think the things got way better since we've been, uh, since I've been in Silon Ridge, and Silon Ridge has been great because um, 
they were making uh, more varieties, so more than just, just Pinot Noir, Pinot Grillo, Chardonnay. It was, uh, it was a Cabernet Sauvignon, it was Syrah, it was Merlot, varieties that I used to work with when I was in, in Argentina. So mm -hmm. that was like a dream come true. So, okay, so I can live in the Willamette Valley, which I like a lot because it's so green, so clean, and also I can make some of these big rates because um, we only have a five acre state vineyard right there. Uh, probably one of the worst sites that you can find <laughs> in the Huilame Valley. And I was uh, funny because I, was, uh, I talked to Doyle Hinman, he was on the property, and he said it took more than three or two, four years to actually settle that vineyard over there because it's facing west. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, no morning sunshine until nine o'clock. So frost image every year, so you lose vines. So it is. Uh -huh. But we were uh, we were buying grapes from Southern Oregon, from Medford area, from the Rogue Valley. So um, and um, so now we have. I work with uh, almost 20 growers, and um, uh, so now we make a Malbec as well. So which is actually. Um, that's my little baby, so it's something that I <laughs> bring me back to Argentina a little bit. So every time I go down there, all my friends come up, and so I show them. And um, I think it's a really good model like, for being outside Argentina, actually. So, mm -hmm. so, um, so coming from a big winery with uh, vineyards and also buying uh, grapes, going to a really small one with the vineyard and back to Joe with uh, more varieties but no vineyards and end up in the, with Ceylon Ridge um, with no vineyards again but more growers and more varieties. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, the, the whole idea for people sometimes they think that they will come and they will see the vineyard and they will drink whatever they produce from that vineyard. Well, when you make 11 different varieties, no way that you can live by the vineyard. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> because the climate has changed. So the terroir is important and the wines that we make, they need more temperature. So sometimes when they say, well, we, I got a few growers down there, that's what we bring. So, um, um, so that's what the part was missing. And so I got myself into uh, have my own vineyard. So that's what I do. So they don't want to have a vineyard? OK, I'll have my own. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, um, I had two little ones in Monroe, which is halfway between the winery and my house. So it's like 22 minutes. Uh, probably my wife didn't like that, I had to say she didn't like the idea of having her own vineyard, but that was part of my passion. So, yeah. like I told her, so we moved to Gorwali because of her, so stick on. <laughs> well, that, that, yes, that was her passion, this is my passion. So, but um, uh, the vineyard side is, is where every, every Every day that you work in the vineyard, it feels like harvest at the wine. Right? It can compare how much you put in the vineyard. It's a lot of work, a lot of work every day. Whatever you do, it's just tedious, man. It's just, uh, so that's why I believe the passion comes from the vineyard because you get to spend so many hours doing the same thing over and over and over and over. So that's why every time that I, um, that I see a vineyard worker, I actually, I, I just, uh, if I have a hat, I was actually a bit too, because it's, uh, they, they, if we got this industry, it's because of them. It's, uh, uh, you bring anyone to work in the vineyard and they probably will do it for two days and they will leave. It's a lot of work and there's not a lot of money in there. So they don't get uh, overtime. Right. So, but you get overtime in the winery. So there's so many good things that you actually can do in the winery that you won't get in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's... Um, so that's now, so that's, uh, and then uh, back in 05, the same time that I was hired, uh, Liz and her family, they bought uh, Panther Creek. And so I got into, and I was working, so I started working with them back in uh, 2010, 2011. I started uh, working with Michael a little bit more, and that's how I got into um, Pinot Noir. 
because they, we specialize more in single vineyards. Uh, so it's 100% uh, Pinot Noir. We have a Pinot Gris over there. The, but it's 100% Pinot Noir, so I got to try so many different vineyards, which I love it. So it's mm -hmm. a different budget, too, so compared to what I get from Silo Ridge, anyway. Mm -hmm. But that, that was actually um, a finished circle of uh, all the uh, winemaking part and the varieties and the immersion into Pinot Noir, 100%, because I can keep uh, so I make Pinot Noir at Ceylon Ridge, but probably we more specialize in, in big reds. Uh, so I can get, I can do that with Ceylon, uh, but I still can play more with Pinot with uh, Elizabeth Chamber Ceylon now. Mm -hmm. That is quite a spread of different places. Yeah, that you've been able to a, a lot of driving too. Um, yeah. um, but I love it. Country, country roads are neat, um, except for winter time, winter sucks. Um, wet and dark and there's no fun there, but it is what it is. Little mm -hmm. sacrifice for the, right. for the industry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you had mentioned something very interesting about vineyard workers. It is such a tough job and it is so important for the industry. In some of the symposiums and conferences we've gone to, it with climate change and mechanization happening, where do you see vineyard workers evolving in the organ wine industry? Do you think we can keep it and keep people and treat them well? Or is it going into mechanization with machinery? Or what is your opinion on that? Well, that's, uh, how many hours are we have? <laughs> um, how's this? Uh, I think if you compare, um, every time that we talk, we talk about Northwest. Um, and Northwest include uh, Washington, and I, I, every time that I see Oregon, I compare to Washington, we're so behind. Uh, Washington is always ahead of us, and, and, and it's important to mention this because they're ahead of vineyard workers. Mm. So we are losing people actually here. We don't, I mean, it's a t like I mentioned, it's a tough job, and we're making everything more complicated for them. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the issues was the uh, the failure of getting the model uh, license, uh, driver license, it's just the, the, the car, in order to, for them to get the um, uh, insurance, which you benefit everyone driving on the street. Um, and there were so many things that we just go against them. Um, and that's what's in, what making them just to, so the economy went down, uh, back in 08, and we're still recording from that. So a few mayors that actually didn't pass, it was just in order to help them, they didn't pass. But we, that is the, the progressive part, because whatever is social will be that, they didn't pass, and on that election. But whatever was for us, like individual part, like marijuana, pass. Go figure. And like, uh, okay, so <laughs> well, 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 everything pass, and there will be, but social measures sometimes they don't pass, and that's, I think, that's what we need for, in order to have a healthy industry from the bottom, because like I mentioned, we have this industry because we have people growing grapes. Without the grapes, we don't have an industry. Right. And, and every, so here and there we talk about mechanization. Uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for all the vineyards that we have. Uh, you can't put a machine through a really steep vineyard, so really tight side, they have a corner that we can turn it on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can do some, you can do it in the valley, you can use it in the valley, or you can use it uh, down south where they have more, more acres. Um, but it doesn't work, it's no one size fits all. It, it's you gotta go, and we, I, I love uh, hand picking. So mm -hmm. for me, I, if I had to pay extra, I'll pay for it. But what's going on right now, is we have all the industry fighting for the same people. So all the very industry. And since our weather change in the way that it's warmer now, and we are ahead, we just overlapping with the berries. And now we're just fighting with for workers, right? And this is time sensitive. So in the vineyard, or you do in the right moment, or you lose it because the vine goes wild. And, 
there's no way. So you get, if they could grow wild, then there's not enough uh, heat exposure for the cluster. There's more uh, pests, more, more mildew, more this. And so for me, that I have two little vineyards, four acres each, I've been doing much of myself because I can find people they know what they have to do. Mm -hmm. And I can be in the vineyard to teach someone else, some, someone new because I don't have time, I don't have free time. Right. Between the two winery and my wife, and um, on the vineyard and also, I wanna, so we're coming out with our own label in September, so this is like, a, so I'm done. <laughs> I, I got all, so I don't, I don't need anything else, but right now I'm just, looking at when, I mean, what can I do for next year? Because I will need people. Right. So I think we, at some point, we'll have to sit down and, and be uh, realistic with this. We, 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 our future is not that great uh, in, in terms of um, uh, labor, mm -hmm. I'll put it that way. You can find people for the winery uh, to work in during harvest, but it's really hard to find people for working in the vineyard. They move around, some of them they go back to Mexico if they're from there, and some of them they go to Washington, they stay in California, or they go somewhere else. Or if they, if they are here, they work in a different industry, like the berry industries. Um, mm -hmm. So Christmas tree, that's another thing. Right. So I don't think, um, like I said, we gotta figure out what to do, because the future is gonna be the present prison. So we're gonna, Hit that road, please. Sure. Mm -hmm. For grape growing, do you have a philosophy? Um, no. Um, well, so I got five years in college, so it's like um, so I got a different one. I'll put it that way. Um, my grandpa. Um, he used to be kind of what they call now biodynamic. So he will be the moon cycle. And when I got into college, they say, well, that's old magic. And this is a new magic. And the, literally they throw the whole thing to the trash can. And we start looking at different things. No more the moon cycle, no more this, no more that one. And um, I'm somewhere in between. I just, um, I don't have the time uh, right now to actually get into organic or biodynamic. I mean, they take more, it's more labor right now. Mm -hmm. I like the concept, I like the ideas behind, but I'm no, um, for example, in uh, Listen Organic, some of the, the, the in, because it, they can't use anything uh, handmade or human made. Um, so they gotta use some other pesticide, like a, like a lot of copper, which is I don't agree on it because it's a heavy metal and also uh, pollutes the soil a lot. So I'm looking into different alternatives, even mm -hmm. for me. So I got in contact with a uh, um, guy that sells uh, ozone machines. So, but for the vineyard. So we use the winery for sanitizing uh, barrels and everything. But it was uh, just spray ozone in water. So you have also generator that will spray water. Um, that five seconds later will be just water. Hmm. So any drift, anything just you get on you, whatever, it's just water. So. I didn't get to try this year. I pay 50% of the machine, didn't show up, and then I cancel it because I didn't want to spend the other 50% for something I would use twice, because it was just in July. Um, but my philosophy is just let it grow. I mean, the best way is just, if you actually know your site, you need to know your site, and you need to know what's best for the vines that are in your site. So mm -hmm. that's what I do. I, I go every time and and um, so I don't use a lot of fertilizers, so just to keep them healthy, 
Um, it's like if you overdose yourself with vitamins. So this mm -hmm. is bad. So you get to a point that uh, you got micro, micro, micronutrients, so you gotta regulate them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I like from biodynamic and organic. Like, or, or the live program, which is sustainable. Uh, that actually put the cap on how much you can actually. Because it's not like the green revolution. This is no. You don't want everything green. You don't want, you know, in those crops, you know, uh, corn, it's no corn, wheat, or anything. So this okay. is. This is uh, great for winemaking, um, and they require a different treatment. So they, they need a lot of sunlight, not too much, not too little. So it's always balanced. So whatever makes it your, your vineyard to be in balance, that's what you have to do, mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is. That, well, that way, that's what you need to know your site. And that's why when you pick the right site, uh, it's way easier. Right. Um, but goes deeper than that, but I don't think we have the time for that. So rootstocks and clones and yeah, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, do you have a winemaking philosophy? Um, again, the same. Um, I know what I like and um, um, I spend many hours in the tasting room, get feedback from our club members or, or just uh, people in the, in the room. And um, I go back over there and then start thinking about it. So I, I like to, I don't do a lot of tasting. I don't go to many wine tasting because uh, I feel like I'm still working anyway. Uh, but I, I get together with my friends. Uh, we swap bottles all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, um, so I know what I like, I know what they like, and that's how I actually start making the wine. Because uh, at the end, you're not making the wine for yourself, so you need right. to sell that. If you don't sell that, then you end up with the wine. <laughs> then you may lose your job. Uh, when we, the funny part, when we started this uh, project with my wife, uh, family project, uh, I told her, so, and she asked me about what variety we wanna be making. I said, whatever I like. I said, why? Yeah, because if I don't get to sell it, I'll drink. <laughs> so yeah, basically, that's that's actually what people came over here. They were just planting what they were, what they would like to drink. Actually, it wasn't even it wasn't the right side though. But uh, so I really minimalistic. I don't uh, I don't find the wines. I just filter the wines. Um, I I spend a lot of time. Get you know in the, the the season. How was the season? For example, um, the last uh, three to four years we have a really hot uh, summers. So you know that those grapes being exposed to a lot of sunshine, and it's like uh, your skin. Every time you get exposed to the sunshine, the color will change. Those are tanning. They're actually to preserve or prevent from uh, burning or, or the UV lights. Mm -hmm. So the skin happens the same. So they put more tanning on the skin. Um, by knowing that, that means that uh, when you have them during fermentation, you can work really hard on the skin because otherwise you will extract too many of those tannins mm -hmm. and then the wine will be tannic. So um, I, when I get the grapes to the wine, I try them. I get to know what happened during the season. I know the growers. So I, I pick up uh, an idea how we will work on those wines. Um, and then we just, I try the, I try the wines every, every day, maybe twice a day, and I will see the, 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 the fermentation process. And we decide, I decide if we had to go differently or we get, so for example, like, like either pump or pump sound. So that's why you actually struggle with color and it's tanning from the skin. So you can do, if you do too many, you will strike. If you do too little, you may not get enough. So basically mm -hmm. you start with probably one to two and you end up with one pump ball. So basically it's no, I don't have a recipe for, I know, I know how to make the thing, but if you follow a recipe every year, you may end up having something different every time. Um, and I don't have a, I don't have secrets, I don't have a recipe. Every time I come and I say, hey, I have a problem, how you make this wine, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay on saying it. I think it's uh, the same like if, you, if you're a chef. I think it gets to the point how you steer the pot, basically. Okay. Uh, what you do actually is, is the result that you're gonna get. Um, 
That's what I like about wine. It's so passionate because every year it's a different chance and it's a different product. Mm -hmm. People may like it, may not, well, it's up to them, but they have to figure out that we're not making burgers. So every year will be different. And I think that's the, the, the amazing part from wine making. Mm -hmm. That every year is different. You can get close. Uh, you have to, I think our job as a winemaker is just to keep up with the quality. But it, it like, again, like the year. I think the Willamette Valley Gas or Walnut, the actually, you know, big challenge right now for um, the growing part because actually you can, you can decide when you want to pick. In right. the past, it's been like, uh, Everyone holding the grapes in the vineyard until they see any storm, and then it's panic, and then everyone starts picking at the same time, and, and the, the wine gets full of grapes at once. So I don't like that either, but uh, so since I work with 20 different guys, it's complicated. <laughs> so, um, um, so that's why um, i very flexible. I just myself to what I think has to be done. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if anyone has a one philosophy, but my philosophy will be making the best wine for you. Making a wine that actually you enjoy, mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's what I want, want people, happy people. So actually you'll, because uh, you, you need to spend money. I mean, uh, if you spend money on something that you don't like, it sucks, and I don't want to be in that. In that so, um, uh, since wine is being in my table all the time, uh, it's an important thing. I mean, you don't bring anyone to your table. So I think it has to be important. So I'm trying to make it that way. That's why I like the tasting room. Because you get to try the wine. You like it, you buy it. There's no like uh, uh, blind dating. <laughs> so it's, you, you know what you get, so literally. Right. So, that, that's what I like. And uh, that's what I, my philosophy is just to always get the fit. Actually, I mean, the feedback from, from customers just to see what they like. Mm -hmm. and how to make those wines for them, too. I like that. Uh, what other projects are you involved in, or are there other areas of the industry that you're passionate about? Um, oh, well, uh, if I say more, then I get in trouble with my wife because she, she may not know. <laughs> no, the other one that I'm involved, I'm a part of the Oregon Wine Board, mm -hmm. um, and I was um, I was one instructor for Chemeketa that actually I quit this year uh, because I got to a point that I wasn't um, um, the Chemeketa part. I'll start with the Chemeketa part. That was um, um, I didn't. I didn't know about that passion, actually. That was something that surprised me that, that I really enjoy. I was enjoying teaching. Um, I didn't see it in me, but my mom was a teacher the, her whole life. Uh, um, and um, since, my, since I didn't pay anything for my career, um, I thought that was a good thing just to try to do something like that here. So, no, we should make it up, but uh, um, through should make it up, I'll be in uh, so many workshops that actually uh, I don't get paid for, so I go there, I teach them. Um, I get into a lot of um, um, safety mm. and, and a lot of also my uh, workshop were at the end into the um, um, pesticides. And uh, that's why actually the ozone came in because um, I, I taught pesticide classes for probably six years, seven years. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that's a tough part. Um, I was always take, uh, tell my, actually my student the uh, life expectancy for uh, a Latin male applying pesticide is 55 years old. So 55 years. And when you hear that, that's the average. So meaning that some people may die before that and some people die after that. So um, that's another part that actually, uh, when we're talking about labor, uh, we should um, talk about because at some point the industry is growing a lot, but there's plenty of room still. So when you get more people coming in, like for example, some other industry like uh, hazelnuts, there's a lot of hazelnuts around. Um, 
uh, when you get more more crops, then you start getting more pollution in the water. So I think our, uh, at some point we may have to look at, at the amount of uh, pesticide that we use, the fertilizer mm -hmm. that we use. Um, I think we're pretty young on that, but if, if we do something pretty soon, actually, it will be really healthy for or sustainable for our industry. Like uh, you can see what's going on in, in, in California, for example, they've got right. drought, they have no water. So basically, Either they, they, they use it for a human consumption or they use it for crops. So they're fighting for get to the point that it's there or us. So, um, so through Shemeker, I got into that. Um, I met a lot of people. I met these, all these vineyard guys, and, um, and I love that. That was, uh, I think I will miss that, but I don't have the time. And, uh, and when you are a, a professor, a teacher, instructor, it, you have to show the passion for it. That's the only way that you uh, you want to get it. So mm -hmm. otherwise, it's just a monologue. So someone just talking, and you just probably checking your cell phone or something. So my pesticide classes were like eight hours straight, eight hours wow. on a Saturday, and they didn't get sleep. So they, they were always, but always teaching like with feedback. So I ask questions to them. If anyone was just kind of like uh, limping a little, it's a question. <laughs> I'll throw a question or keep them up, but motivated. So, and um, I think we, for what I heard from this guy, we don't do a good job in, 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 in pesticides. So, um, an example, so by law, if you're getting to, you wanna work in my vineyard before I can put you, expose you pesticide. So I had to teach you what is mm -hmm. pesticide, the, 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 how to use the, the, the personal protection equipment, uh, what could happen to you, mm -hmm. uh, first aid. It's a lot of things that this guy, if you ask, they don't, they didn't get that. So they, they throw them they put them on the tractor and just they tell them how many ounces, how many pounds, and just go and do it. And uh, so that's, that's tough because um, I'm the one spraying my fingers and I'm the one say I don't want anyone else doing it. That's what I want to get something that's less um, or more healthy or less risky for them right. or for myself. And uh, I think that's why actually when I talk with people say, well, using uh, different technology is more expensive. So, well, it is more expensive, but it's safety. It's safer that way. Well, but it's more expensive. So, yeah, because you don't spray, man, literally. So when you talk to, it's, it's, it's a funny talk because you, it, it depends on what you're talking to. Mm -hmm. You're talking to the owner, it's all about numbers. Oh, no, too, too expensive, but it's better. Not too expensive, okay. <laughs> so some people care, some people don't care. Um, but at least by law, they had to send their guys to this class, for example. And I'm the one teaching them how to, so, so they can go and get their uh, pesticide license. So, right. Um, and now that, uh, this is my second term for the Oregon Wine Board. So, um, and that's been one of the greatest things. Uh, Actually, I have a meeting today with them too. Um, get it, when you work for the board, so you're volunteering, so there's no money involved, uh, but it's a lot of time involved, so you spend a lot of hours. And uh, so we meet every other month, but then everyone has a committee. So my is the research committee, mm -hmm. and um, so I work with the guy from the Oregon Wine Research Institute, uh, Osu. So I'm kind of the, the, the bridge between the board, the industry, and the, the I know it's you, I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, that's been, a, uh, been fascinating for me because uh, I got to see uh, Oregon from a different view, from a different mm -hmm. picture. I get to see the whole picture of uh, what's going on with the industry, what's going on in the research side. Um, I get to, hang out with brilliant people. I mean, like people, they've been in the industry longer than me, they have their own business, and uh, um, it's just amazing uh, um, what we can do, uh, what's the future for the, for the industry. It's a, it's a bright future. Um, um, but it takes a lot of time. Mm 
and some people don't appreciate what you do actually. <laughs> so people are actually because uh, we get money from uh, grave tax. They, they, it's like some people don't want to pay taxes at all. I mean, they don't want to pay anything. They want everything perfect, but they don't want to spend any money on it. Like, well, this is not going to happen. So we end up in a lot of, uh, we spend a lot of time, uh, our free time, uh, working for the industry, right. for the state. Mm -hmm. uh, looking, um, the biggest challenge right now for the industry is just uh, we've been having, um, which is not common, but having um, high yield, high quality, which is great. But high yield means more wine. And the last uh, two to three years, been, uh, yields have been up to 20 to 30%. If you look at it, it's like, okay, can you sell every year 20 to 30% more wine? Probably not. Right. So what are you going to do with that wine? So part of the board is uh, on the marketing side trying to uh, open more channels for uh, the, the, uh, the, our wine just to go somewhere else. So we can actually move that wine around and, and get it out of the, the bond market. And, but like I said, fortunately, it's been through to three years. So we're getting to the point that is uh, in many wineries, they have wine in, in tanks right now and looking for if they can sell it in the ball market. But the ball market is saturated. So these are the big challenge for the wine. It's better than having high yield, low quality. I mean, I think <laughs> so. And I think that um, getting more players in the industry from uh, California, from uh, Europe, from Washington is also helping the industry as well. Um, because they have more, a bigger, uh, more muscle in the marketing area. So they get with their guy, they, they reach uh, further places. So right. I think. Uh, that reminds me, when I was in Argentina, in Mendoza, when the Malbec boom, the, 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 they took off. And there was a lot of uh, foreign wine that came in, and there was this uh, paranoia about what's gonna happen to our industry because, I mean, we were just us, and then now it's this big guy, if they wanna take over the industry. I mean, but actually, they help the industry. I mean, Malbec got everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and Mendoza got, to, got well known because Malbec everywhere. Everyone knows about Malbec. And every time you say Malbec, you, you refer that to Argentina, to Mendoza. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're doing with Pinot Noir. And uh, so when they say Pinot Noir, it's Oregon. And what we're doing right now is just also working in the other varieties that we actually produce over here. So all the different ABAs, so the, the 18 ABAs that we have in, uh, in Oregon. Um, using also Pinot Noir as a driver for different varieties because when you try Pinot Noir, you like it, and you say, oh, this is from Oregon, and then people will say, what else do you have from Oregon? And then you may have a Cabernet Sauvignon, you may have a Syrah, you may have a Tempranillo, or Malbec that we're making, and we're making more, uh, making some news about it. So um, that's been, um, I got two more years with the board, um, and then I'll be done. Um, but it's been great. So um, I think that's, uh, um, I think everyone should be able, I mean, it's impossible anyway, but able to see the industry from a different perspective. And they will get a better picture of what they should be doing or working on it. Because uh, the problem with the industry is sometimes you get isolated. And you get inside the one year, you don't business, and you don't look around. And the best part is just to look around. Either go to your neighbor, go to different ABAs, mm. see what they're doing, go to different states, like go to California, maybe Washington, go abroad, just go to Europe, see what they're doing, go to South America, go to New Zealand. Go. I think that's what opens your mind, and you get better ideas, a better knowledge of what you may want. When you get isolated, I don't think it's a good thing. So I think you need to travel more. And I think that's why you actually, you can uh, make better wines that way or grow better grapes that way. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for the wine board, what goals do you hope to see them accomplish as the organization helping the wine industry? Um, 
for the board. Um, I think we're, we're in the right path. Um, we, we don't. We don't have probably we don't have enough money for what we want, um, and everyone say, "Oh, more money." Well, <laughs> everything is more expensive, so we got inflation, and uh, in order to we got a bigger industry. I mean, we got more uh, more grapes actually, uh, and it's been helpful for the world, been having these uh, high yields because uh, we get more money from taxes. So. Mm -hmm. The problem with the board is just all that budget has to be divided up in four four legs. So you have uh, the research, the the, uh, the education, uh, marketing, and the staff. So you gotta pay all that. So what we want the board, but well, we want the board to be uh, the main driver for the industry. Just wanna help every single one industry. If you coming in from any different business. So you get to know through the board how to will provide a workshop, webinars, everything through education of how to grow grapes, how to make wine. That's why we put together the symposium. Symposium is a big thing for us. Every year, it takes a year to make a, a three days symposium, literally. And uh, every year is a big challenge, bigger challenge because you need to get better or, or have b different topics. And sometimes the topics don't change much mm -hmm. year by year. This is a, a different, we know in the, in, in the like Silicon Valley, for example, the technology is different every six months. Right. So here is different. So, but our goal is just to get in the education part, so you learn through the, the uh, at least from the board on the, on the big umbrella, and then different, the ABA has their own associations anyway, so that you can get more specific. Mm -hmm. um, then there will be the research, so fund, uh, or find and fund these projects through uh, OSU. Mm -hmm. They will be actually really important for our industry, so more Instead of being something more general, so being more specific for different ABAs, so just not just Pinot Noir, but for different grapes. Because you know that, like for example, Cabernet Sauvignon grows well in many different places, but you need to know what's the best way to do it in this ABA. For example, right. the Rogue Valley or, or the Walla Walla with mm -hmm. Syrah or the Columbia Gorge anywhere. Um, and then the marketing part. Uh, we're going to provide the tools for the industry, how to do, now we're working on the um, exportation, mm -hmm. so the international market, that's a new thing. And um, if you're working by yourself, you may end up spending a lot of money and get nowhere. But if you do it through the Orion Wine Board, that's different, because we have the muscles and we have more people, and actually we uh, partnership with uh, Washington a lot. Mm -hmm. And we go by Northwest, and that's cheaper and more uh, efficient for both industries. So um, that's why I don't see actually um, uh, Washington has a competitor. Actually, I see has a partner, um, and they see us the same way. Actually, they, we benefit even. Even when we make some bad ideas, the same bad ideas, but actually we don't see that we compete, actually, um, because of Pinot Noir as well. So I think that's uh, the three uh, areas where we're working. And like I say, every year is a different challenge because the industry is reshaping itself every year. Mm -hmm. um, but we get to see that. and. Um, um, the staff that we have, the board, are amazing, brilliant people, and they know what they're doing, and it's just amazing. Every time I have a meeting with them, it's just when they start seeing, uh, showing you what they're doing, what they're going to be working on, it's like, wow. It's just, um, and unfortunately, not a lot of people get uh, an advantage of what we're doing with the board. They, sometimes they don't, like I said, they get isolated, and they want to do it their own way, and so be it. But if you look at the, our website, uh, it's a lot of tools. Um, uh, even now we have a, um, um, so like a marketplace for uh, if you're selling grapes, you can do it through the board as well. If you're selling equipment or you want to buy equipment. So I think we're still using some other one websites, uh, um, but I think uh, the, um, our goal is to be the first um, 
source for you. Mm -hmm. You are in Oregon, the board is the first source. So you want to get, I don't know, whatever it is, which should be through us. Uh, it's it not monopolizing thing, it's just making better tools for you so you don't spend hours and you get to where you want to get. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a problem with uh, internet right now. So it's a lot of information, but a lack of knowledge. You get overwhelmed, and then you get nowhere. Mm -hmm. And then, because you don't know what to do with it. So if you can focus or channel that into a few spots, it's you get better, you get more productive. Um, I'm productive, too. So that's, that will be the goal for, for us at the board. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> More money. Yeah. <laughs> Another big uh, crop. That's what we <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, since you have had um, exposure to other wine industries abroad, how does the Oregon wine industry sort of compare and contrast with your experiences and observations elsewhere? Okay. Um, well. The first time that I got here, um, I wasn't only surprised by the Pinot Noir, by the color of Pinot Noir. I was surprised by, I didn't see a lot of technology. Mm. I, was, I was amazed that I actually, um, so that was in my head. So coming into the U.S., I thought the technology was, it will be everywhere. And um, uh, the place that I worked, which was Willame Valerinia, and we didn't use a sorting table. I mean, we just have a disclaimer, the press, and the pumps, and the barrels, and the grapes. And you make good wine because actually grapes are good, and that's it. That, that was it. So um, we have more, I have more technology in Mendoza than I got here until today's day. We don't mm -hmm. have a lot of technology. Do we need or not? That's the, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, we may need some, actually, I think you can improve with uh, having the right equipment. It doesn't have to be expensive, but now it's more into sorting tables and uh, optical sorting, very sorting. So it's not just before the classic get to the stemmer, it's also what happened after the stemmer. And I think that's why if you want to spend money in technology, uh, you should look for what happened after the stemmer. So what happened to the berries? Um, I think that's why we spend money in our wine right now. So in a, in a different stemmer that actually is more gentle, doesn't make a salad out of the, 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 the stems. And actually can, it will do, it has rollers that actually, um, it will select the size of the berry. Because sometimes you have a green berry that's really small, they will fall and go away, not into the fermenter. And also, um, berry they have a mildew or botrytis, they're even smaller or they are broken, so they will fall to another, uh, so to the uh, um, a third line, which is go to the trash, basically. So what, whatever goes to the fermenter is what you want to be in the fermenter. Right. No. So I think if you want to spend money in technology, is is what uh, happened after the cluster goes to the distemmer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was um, that was one of my uh, first uh, impression about the industry, uh, and then everything different because we're pretty young. I mean, we're still talking about people that got here in the '60s or the '70s. Um, um, everywhere else, they have at least 100 years. Uh, the industry has 100 years. Right. I think it's a benefit for, for the industry here because we can learn from mistakes than somewhere else. Mm -hmm. If you get to see them too, that's what I think uh, if you look at different um, industry, it, it's healthy. Mm -hmm. It's not looking at them as a competition, it's looking at them, what they're doing, what they're doing well, what we can do here. Mm -hmm. um, I think everyone is more shaping into what's the U.S. market right now, everywhere uh, around the world. Because if you look at the, um, the um, wine drinkers, so you got the baby boomers, and they're going out of the equation now. So you got the Generation X, you got the millennials. So it, you know that people and more people are drinking wine. So. It, the, the amount of the, the wine consumption is improving, is increasing every year. So everyone else is decreasing. So this all the industry around the world, 
uh, they are looking at their own domestic markets just falling apart because a new generation, they're, they're not into wine. Like happened in Argentina, mm. uh, happened in France, happened in Spain. So they are looking at what we're doing here, how to make the wine, that actually there will be a market over here for them. And um, I think it's just, uh, um, so you can learn, they can learn from us, we can learn from them. Um, I think the US market is, is totally different to what, what was my market, my, my domestic market. And I think that's what actually shape, is shaping the industry as well. Uh, the US market is a market that um, likes sweet wines, for example. So still the majority likes sweet wines. Uh, say it's uh, Moscats, uh, Rieslings, and uh, many other ones, and some uh, sweet roses. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it's changing into a more sophisticated market, so more people like more dry wines. But when you say dry, people are some, they, it's uh, harsh, rough, it's totally not. It's not mm -hmm. Dry means no sugar, but that means it has to be harsh or rush in your mouth. Um, uh, something that actually changed uh, the industry, at least in Argentina, was uh, when you want to buy a bottle of wine in the U.S. You may want to buy a bottle of wine for because you may have a party, uh, uh, because you have a dinner, but you want to drink it that night. Mm. And it used to be the concept that when you buy wine, you need to put the wine away for X amount of years, five years, because it's really tannic and all the two get smooth. Mm -hmm. um, so the first uh, wine they got into the market, they probably sucks because people, they, they didn't think about putting away the wine. They were thinking about drinking the wine that night. Mm -hmm. And when you got that experience, it's a bad experience, and then you don't want that wine or that winery or that place anymore. And mm -hmm. it's like it takes one bad bottle of wine for one person to say, I'm done. I'm done with you. And uh, so now is the concept of whatever you uh, put in the bottle has to be drinkable. And you know that later on will get better too. Mm -hmm. So, but has to be drinkable, enjoyable. And that's what I believe that I. Tasting room is a good part of the industry because you get to try it how they taste right now, and then in that way you you decide from that moment that you try the wine if you want to drink it that night or you want to drink it in a year or you want to do this experiment of drinking one bottle per year just to see when you want to hit the the, the prime time of the wine. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's uh it's uh, the, the the industry the whole. One industry in the U.S. Now we have uh, more regions, uh, so you got the East Coast with their wines too. It's not just the West Coast, and everything is shaping. So mm -hmm. reshaping, and, uh, and and this is making uh, all industries reshaping as well because they had to um, every year something new, right. or new people, new varieties, always looking for what's new, what's unique, and now we're going back to. Uh, the terroir. It used to be the other region, now the terroir. So single vineyards. Uh, now. Mm -hmm. uh, now we want to know about uh, what's in the bottle. And sometimes I have issue with uh, European wine because they don't say what it is in the bottle. So you need to know what's in, what the ABA they have over there, what's allowed to grow over there, and then that being a blend of different grapes, there could be two, three, but if you don't know what it is. That's what I like from here, that actually we go buy varietals. Mm -hmm. So I think that's changing and it's reshaping actually the industry um, around, uh, around the world. Um, um, still young, and I think that's the, probably the youngest industry that we have, uh, at least on this side. But it's, um, I think it's a plus for us. I think uh, we are improving every, every year. Uh, Pinot Noir um, is getting to new places, new people, but it's not a variety that actually makes a lot of fans. Um, Maybe in the Willamette Valley, I know people that are f a, a Pinot Noir fans. They will only drink Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of people, they will start the night with Pinot Noir or the white and then Pinot and then something heavier, something mm -hmm. with more body. Um, so that's why I think it's important for us to actually uh, present 
a uh, different option from Oregon, like mm -hmm. Carnes Oignon, like Sierra, Tempranillo, Malbec. Okay. So you start with Pinot Noir, and then you move on with other varieties. That's what I like. So I enjoy different wines, but I had the order, that order. Um, I think that's, our industry has to focus on that. Otherwise, the people that are not, they can drink Pinot Noir all night long, it, it will end up buying a bottle from someone else, and you want them to buy Oregon all the time. So. That's what we're doing with the war, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think perhaps your children will follow into the wine industry, much like you followed your dad and your grandpa? Um, I'm not sure. I hope. Uh, but what I'm doing, I'm doing for myself and for them. But um, I can't expect them to do what I like. Um, I will do my best to show what I do. Uh, and, and to show them the passion that I have for what I do. And if they feel like they want to be in that, good for them. Um, if they want to do, if they want to do. Um, funny because uh, my son is, is going to be four and my daughter is two. And uh, last night I was having a, we were watching a movie with my wife and, and both of them. And uh, we were drinking some wine with her. And um, they always get amazed by the wine glass and the wine mm -hmm. smell. Mm -hmm. And and now we're talking about oh I think he, she's gonna be the one who would like to work outside. He looks like a, maybe we'll like in the in the wine. He's like a, I mean that's four and two. <laughs> like, <laughs> but you're a parent, so you, I mean you uh, you want them to work with you, and uh, probably that's what actually my mom will say, but it didn't happen to her. So I I. I've, flew away and <laughs> now I live in the US and I, I do I'm 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 in the same industry like my dad but I'm 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 far away. I'm <laughs> really far away from them. Uh, uh, but it's a small um, um I get a lot of emotional sometimes I talk about that, but it's a little sacrifice for my family too. So if they wanna do what I do if they want to do it with me, fine. If they want to do what I do somewhere else, fine. If they want to do what their mom does, uh, it's fine too. Actually, my wife now is in, the, in this project with me, so I have more power. So I pull <laughs> harder on my side, actually. But um, if they want to do what I do, um, I'm, my plan will be just to send them down to Argentina, actually, for tuition. So it's free down there. Um, I'm nothing against what happened here, but I want them to actually have the experience that I have in the opposite way. So they come mm -hmm. from here, they can see here, and then they can work in their master or PhD program if they want over here. Um, but I want to force them to do whatever. I want them to be happy. So whatever makes them happy, if it's in my uh, reach, I will do it for them. Um, I think the best way to teach is by the example. So if they see me doing that, and I think probably they will get it, at least they will understand what, uh, what I do and why I spend so many hours outside. Um, and, and now it's like, uh, I have to be a better example now because now they talk like me or, or they do what I do. So it's like, okay, so, <laughs> so I make sure that what I do, it actually when people say that your kids make you a better person, it's true. They make you a better person because you see yourself in there. Mm. And it's not, if you see it that way, it's not like someone say, hey, you don't clean, you don't do it. No, Did you see it because you see you are their example. And uh, so I think that's why you want to be do better. So to improve different areas that actually you may know, um, you may be lacking of. Um. So we'll see. They're pretty young, so well, um, the industry is young, so there's more room for more growers and more winemakers. So we'll see what the future is. Uh, is, is, is. It will be here, it will be down in, in, in Argentina, it will be in Europe, who knows? Right. Mm -hmm. I have to take care of them, and that's what the part that I'm doing. I show you what I do, and if, like I say, if I'm lucky and they want to do the same, fine. But it's up to them. I, I want them to uh, start drinking wine. The first, if they want to drink alcohol, I want them to teach them how to get into the wine. Because um, 
I got to try one when I was really young. Maybe I, was, um, I get to try like with a finger when I was a little kid though, um, what they do with them sometimes. Uh, but to try the first time, I think was probably 12, 13, somewhere in there. Um, when you try wine, you gotta, you gotta start doing the, the tasting, the, the whole process of this, uh, swirling the wine, looking at the color, uh, the nose, the bouquet, and then you put it in your mouth and you make it go side by side, back forward, da, 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 da. and then uh, you talk about the grape, the vintage, if anyone has any, anything to say, and then when you look at it, you probably spend 15 minutes for one sip. So that's the best way to get them into alcohol because otherwise with beer or anything, it's just drunk it. And that's mm -hmm. it, uh, I don't want that. Uh, what I'm seeing here, because of drinking age is 21, I mean, when they get to that age, they don't even drink. They just swallow the whole thing and get drunk. So I don't, I hate that. Mm -hmm. And we want, you can't do that. If we want, you gotta follow the process. So you gotta respect the, what the, my process of putting maybe a year or two years in making into the one, at least just to look at it, smell mm -hmm. it, taste it, drink it, mm -hmm. if you like it. So I think that would be, that was good for me because I have a different appreciation for, uh, for alcohol and for wine. Mm -hmm. um, and I was telling one guy that he's a brewmaster, so how we actually look differently to different products because I get, I get to make one once a year, literally. So it's once a year, you screw it up, that's it. If you make a wine, so you get, uh, next year we'll get another chance. When you brew, you can brew every, every day, every week, different batches, and you don't like it, you throw it, just brew another one. So for us, it's a different process. Mm -hmm. And that's something that actually, <laughs> my dad got it from uh, a lot of Italian they use, um, so they bless over that way the wine with uh, carbonated water. Huh. And, and they do that a lot. And they do that because it was the only way to drink a wine that wasn't harsh, because mm -hmm. otherwise you gotta wait five years. And if you don't have enough money, you can't do that. You gotta buy a wine and drink it that day. That's what I'm saying about the market mm -hmm. over here. And my dad still does the same. And every time they bring bottle from here down to Argentina, he's going with the freaking <laughs> carbonated water. He said, "Don't do that. Please. Don't do that. Don't do that." So you don't know how much time spent or oh, that one spent in the barrel just to get smooth. So you don't have to do that anymore right. because you are smooth. Say, so, well, but I like it that way. I say, okay, <laughs> oh, I won't spend any money in wine for you. So you drink whatever you want and you, you do, you put water, you, you blend it with water, dilute it. That's what they do. So, right. so I think the wine, um, it's a good social thing. Um, the industry is a great industry. You work with people with, uh, since you can't get millionaire here. It's not an industry that, like I, I will compare with Silicon Valley, so, or, or, or software or anything. You get, you, you, you could be, become a billionaire with a B. Uh, here you can get rich probably if you do well, mm -hmm. but that's it. And, and that makes it, the industry to be, com, uh, the component of the industry, people that actually don't looking for money. 100% for money. Or just, so people are actually more willing to be more calm guys, more down to earth guys. And plus they're working with something that grows outside, so they need to go outside. So the lifestyle of the industry is good. It's pretty good. That's mm -hmm. what I, I like, I enjoy. I enjoy Oregon and the Willamette Valley. And I think that's what I want for my kid because it's a healthy industry. It's a healthy um, a lifestyle that way. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, right now, it got so expensive that uh, in order to have your own thing, you need to have money. So that's why you have the new players now are either bigger companies or people that made their money in a different business and now they're using that money just to have their own hobby. Uh, expensive hobby, I'll put it that way. So, um, but still room for more people. And that's why 
I, I think it's a healthy industry what we have. Uh, we healthy people. Um, plus, drinking wine make you healthier. So, it's red true. wine. So, right? It's been proven. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was all the prepared questions that I okay. had. Was there anything that I should have asked, or anything that you want to add? No, I'm not sure if you have more any questions. Any questions that popped up for you guys? All right. Well, thank you so much, JP. We'll go ahead and conclude the formal part of our taping. Okay, thank you.